Thank you very much, David. Uh, and thank you for that very nice introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today and present to you some of the work that I've been doing. Um, as you probably can tell, I'm not actually originally from Japan. I am of Japanese ancestry, but I'm actually American. So I used to be at uh, the UCSD, uh, University of California, San Diego, um, before I got my position here at AIST. Um, and so as David mentioned, you know, I've been working in a lot of different areas. And so one of you know, this, this effort here, looking at uh, some information technologies for natural disaster management is kind of a new area for me. And something that I've been working on over the last couple of years. And so I'm gonna go through some of the, uh, highlight some of the work that we've been doing in this area. We, yeah, okay. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, since of course Australia is sitting in the Pacific Rim as well, uh, along with Japan and of course California, natural disasters are of course uh, very uh, common around the, nat the Pacific Rim. Um, you know, all of the countries are along the Pacific Rim are susceptible to many different types of natural disasters, earthquakes, typhoons, flooding, and of course it causes widespread damage of loss and life, uh, damage and loss of life. Um, I probably don't need to remind most people about the earthquake that happened in 2011 in Japan. Um, you know, it's quite a, you know, an epic event uh, and, uh, you know, caused a lot of uh, damage in Japan and so you know natural disaster management here in Japan is kind of a big topic and has been actually over the last five six years um, so because of this you know a lot of the research and development of the next generation tools to help manage data during these events is really critical and uh, you know and so that's kind of the area that I'm, I'm, I'm working in um, the disaster management cycle for those of you who are not really familiar with the actual cycle and I'm not necessarily an expert in disaster management But you know the there is an established cycle for disaster management and there's four phases. There's the mitigation preparedness response and recovery phases um, Each one of these phases has a lot of I mean they're, they're each one individually is a very big effort and has a lot of different um, factors involved in each one of them but I'm more focused on the response phase, and so I'm trying to narrow down and focus a little bit on my efforts. Um, and the response is defined as the immediate or ongoing activities and systems to manage the effects of an incident um, and help reach a stable status for the entity. So usually during this response phase, you know, the disaster is occurring, and so many of the disaster management uh, professionals have a lot of data coming at them from different sources. And so that's kind of the area that I'm working in, is how do you manage this type of data and make it usable and accessible for uh, the uh, disaster management professionals. So with that in mind, uh, the long-term goals then um, are kind of to set up this multi-site immersive visualization environment for disaster management. And I've kind of sketched it out here, trying to give you kind of a bigger picture idea of kind of what's going on here. And even again, as I said, you know, even though I'm looking at just the response phase, there's still, this is really a multifaceted uh, you know, type of uh, endeavor. Um, so, you know, the idea is that if you had decision makers at site A and decision makers at site B, um, you know, they need to be able to look at and collaborate on the same type of data. So, for example, um, you know, if the users at site A, for very simply, you know, if they move a map up, then that needs to be reflected at the, the for the decision makers at site B. Um, if the decision makers at site B uh, add data to say this collaborative environment or this uh, multi-site environment, then that needs to be reflected back to the uh, decision makers at site A. Um, and so again, this is kind of, you can think of it kind of as a you know, digital whiteboard or a war room, so to speak. And so um, you know, trying to be able to create something like this for disaster management is a significant challenge. Additionally with that, uh, there is also kind of some type of infrastructure that needs to support this whole interaction between the two different sites. And of course, it's probably, uh, you know, software, uh, software defined types of uh, 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 infrastructures are going to be very important in this regard to help support this and maintain the continuity of information. So, uh, you know, with, with that big picture in mind, I've kind of uh, down here at the bottom, I've kind of laid out maybe if you want to call them layers, you can. Uh, there, there's more three different areas that um, I'm kind of working in. One of them is, is that the user interface or the experience. So of course, you know, as I said, you know, you need to be able to make this data accessible and uh, usable by these decision makers. And so trying to be able to figure out uh, ways to improve the usability of applications and how to actually interact with the content is, a, is, is, a very, is an important area to work in. Uh, the applications themselves is uh, very, very uh, important, obviously. Uh, as I said, you know, these decision makers are having a lot of data come at them from different you know, sensors and different sources, and it's very heterogeneous. And so how do you actually aggregate 
and use and, and you know, be able to analyze and, and perform analytics over these types of data uh, is very, very important. Uh, along with data visualization as well. So again, how do you get the data in a form that allows the decision makers to understand it very quickly because they need to when they're trying to respond to a uh, disaster. And as I mentioned before, the software-defined infrastructure, this is kind of the underlying infrastructure that's necessary to maintain the continuity of all this information. And so software-defined networking concepts and even software-defined uh, storage uh, concepts will be very useful for the data actually um, in, these, uh, in this type of uh, environment. Next slide. Yeah, okay. Um, so now that I've talked about kind of this bigger picture, you know, kind of the more focusing in on more of, and, and just kind of more of a piece of, uh, uh, a little bit of a piece. I'm not gonna talk too much about the infrastructure, although we've done some work with some of the other MERPA students uh, on software-defined storage. Um, but uh, you know, this, this particular effort is looking at immersive visualization or immersive analytics. Um, for those of you who are from Monash, uh, you probably know the immersive analytics group there, and so I've been fortunate enough to work with some of them, and I'll be presenting some of that work in just a couple minutes. But for those of you who are not familiar with this immersive visualization or analytics, basically, uh, you know, big data is really invaluable to all different sectors of society, but it really requires an interdisciplinary effort and next generation technologies specifically interactive type of environments that can immerse the user in data and provide tools for data analytics. Um, you know, something common that people usually say is that they're kind of drowning in data. There's all this data, and so if I could just be in the data, you know, then I could, you know, make better sense of it. And so that's kind of where immersive visualization or immersive analytics comes in, is to be able to immerse users in data. So there are kind of three different research areas that I'm looking at, and uh, one of them is to develop applications to investigate the usability of new types of immersive visualization technologies for disaster management. Um, the second area is to explore combinations of 2D and 3D representations of data, and how do you combine those in these immersive environments. So immersive environments allow you to actually present data in a 2D format and or a 3D format, and I'll show you an example of that uh, in just a minute. And uh, the third area is really investigate the broader value of immersive visualization for different domains. So that involves a lot of user testing and really trying to figure out and address the question, does immersive environments, are they better or how do they help people in a way that's different from maybe traditional uh, you know, presentations of visual or visualizing data? <clears throat> so natural disasters, as I mentioned, there are, there are many different types of them, but uh, you know, I focused in on river disaster management. Um, and so one of the, so I, I've been working on this, as I said, for a couple of years, and actually finding data to try and build some of these you know, applications in this type of environment is actually exceedingly difficult. It was surprisingly difficult. Um, you know, many people talk about open data and how the data are open, and that's true. There, there are a lot of data sets that are open, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're accessible or usable. So we had a lot of trouble trying to find data, but you know, sometime in the middle of about last year, uh, we found uh, a public website from the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, and Transport here in Japan, which is a publicly open website, and it had over more than 15,000 different types of sensors in this uh, website providing data. Um, rainfall, river height, snow, uh, shoreline, uh, you know, the height of the water at the shore uh, in the ocean, uh, water quality and dam sensors. And they, they uh, are pro providing all this data in this website. Um, the data production varies depending on the sensor. Um, some of the sensors pr provide data every 10 minutes and others up to every hour. Um, and interestingly enough, some of the sensors go offline and online during different periods. And I'll show you how we figured that out. But it's interesting because uh, they have a very traditional website. Um, go forward. <laughs> Okay, um, so this is what their current website looks like. Um, I apologize for the Japanese, uh, but this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, you have a map here of the area that you want. You can select different types of sensors up here. You can see the icons for camera, and uh, this is for uh, radar or rain. There's dam here, and uh, river height, I believe, is this first one here. Um, you can select which province or which area in Japan that you want to look at. Um, on, the, on the actual area, you can see the different types of sensors. There's a camera sensor here, and there's some other different types of sensors. And if you click on them, you can actually select the, the different um, types of uh, 
uh, or data that you want to look at. Yeah, there we go. Um, and so that one there is showing you actually rainfall. Uh, the area we're in is Mito. Uh, it's a little bit north of where I am in Scuba. Um, this is a river height data, and it opens it up in a new web page, by the way. So these are all actually separate web pages. So you click on this, and it opens up this new web page. This is river height, um, and this is actually camera data. So they actually do have CCTV cameras providing data, looking at the river, so you can tell visually, like, if it, is the water height higher or lower than normal. Um, and so, again, this is a very traditional way of, uh, of presenting the data, and it does work. It does work. But we wanted to try and do something a little bit different with it. So what we did was, was the student that I had from Monash uh, created a web crawler and collected data for a month from, these, from this website. And so this is the data that we have in this picture here. Um, it looks better on a top display wall, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, since we don't have one here, uh, we'll have to kind of work through this picture here. Um, so each pixel along the bottom here is one sensor. And then uh, in the vertical axis or the ordinate there, each pixel is a 10 minute time interval. So if the pixel is, uh, is colored, then that means we had data for that particular sensor at that particular time. Um, and so uh, over here on the far left corner here, or edge here, this is green. It's, I know it's difficult to see, but uh, this is the uh, water quality uh, sensors. The next big blue section here, that is the river height sensors. Uh, in between here in white, again, I know it's hard to see, but there are a few sensors here for snow. Uh, then it's rainfall, uh, shoreline, and dam sensors. And so you can already see there's some interesting patterns emerging just by looking at this data, This, you know, whether or not the sensor provided data. So if it's over here, uh, it's a little bit clearer to see. You can see that some of these sensors were creating, giving, you know, providing data, and all of a sudden they go dark, and they're not providing any more data. Um, interestingly, there's some sensors over here that were, were providing data, they went dark for a period of time, and then they came back online for some reason. Um, we're not exactly sure why this is happening, but you know, it's, it is interesting because we're seeing this, uh, you know, looking at the data in this way is giving us some insight into you know, how the sensors are behaving. Um, you may be able to see this line that goes all the way across here, right across through all the data. And so that actually is, uh, you know, as I said, my student uh, created a web crawl and was collecting data, and this was a time period where his internet connection went out in Australia and he lost connection, so therefore he couldn't collect data for a few hours, and so that's what's missing there. So we had this data, um, and so we then took it and, go forward. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, and so, sorry. Uh, so this is actually just a close-up of uh, this particular section just to kind of give you a better idea of kind of the patterns that we're seeing in the data and what it looks like a little bit up close. So now that we have this data, we wanted to try and put it into a, a VR application, so a virtual reality type of application. And so Matt Reddy is the student who I was working with, and Tim Dwyer from Monash. Um, you know, if he's there in the audience, hello. <laughs> um, we uh, uh, built this, uh, you know, small application. We combined a lot of the ideas of taking, you know, a 3D virtual environment and combining it with 2D representations of the data. And unfortunately, uh, you know, with virtual reality applications, it's a little bit hard to share that. So I'm going to try and play a video. Hopefully, this comes out okay. Um, I don't know how, you know, the band, hopefully the internet connection will be, hopefully it won't be too choppy, but, uh, oops, sorry, let me go back. Uh, where did my cursor go? Okay. It may not stream that well. Um, hopefully it's not too choppy, but basically we're trying to give you an overview. This is all of the data points across Japan. Um, we have, we actually use Google Maps for the, uh, the actual map of Japan, uh, satellite maps from Google. And we ingested them into the uh, Vive application, or the VR application. Um, the right-hand controller uh, is basically for movement. So basically, if you press on this, depending on where you point it, you can move around in your environment. Um, and you can move closer to sensors or further away if you, if you want to get a better view of it. The right-hand, uh, or sorry, the left-hand controller uh, is actually to control the data. And you can actually scroll through. If you press on the uh, touchpad on the controller, you can left, right, you can go through the data and you can actually see the data every 10 minutes change, basically, over the period of about a month. Um, and so you can already see some interesting patterns there. When you view that, you can see the light blue that kind of goes from one edge of the Japan up to the other. 
um, it may be a little bit hard to see. So what we can do is we can turn off some of the other sensors and just look at the rainfall sensor and the river height sensors. And you can see the light blue is the rain. And you can see that that was a, a thunderstorm or storm system that moved from the bottom of Japan, Okinawa, all the way up through and passed up to the northern part of Japan. Um, what's kind of cool about this is that you can actually see trends in the data in that you can see that there was lots of rainfall and then later on the river height goes up afterwards, after the rain passes through, which logically makes sense. Um, so then if you want to look at specific sensors, you can actually go in and actually target specific sensors and select uh, the information from the particular sensor um, in the way of these cards. And so some of the sensors produce different types of data. Um, for example, the rainfall sensors show instantaneous and cumulative rainfall. And so what we did was, was we put up the cards and then uh, you're able to actually even maintain geo positioning by clicking on the icon there at the bottom of the card and it puts a line down to uh, so that you know exactly what sensor you're looking at. And then you can scroll through the data again. Um, in a certain way, we've linked the data. So as this global changes here, you can actually see the chart changes as well. Um, and in this data, you can see that the, the that, uh, you, know, you can look at the actual the rainfall actually increases. As the rainfall increases, then the river height increases. And it's a, there's a time lag in that. And the user can still maneuver around in the virtual space and uh, look at other things if he wants. These cards stay with you, depending on where you put them, where you mount them in, in the virtual space. And when the user wants to get rid of them, he actually just takes it and throws it, and they explode. <laughs> so that was uh, my student's way of trying to make it a little bit fun. <laughs> Uh, we try to take advantage of the back of the cards as well. Um, the back of the cards, you, we put a little bit of information. You could put more, obviously, but uh, we put the latitude and longitude of the particular sensor there, it, just trying to, again, capitalize on the fact that we do have uh, extra space to put up information if, if needed. And so then, you know, the rest of the video just kind of goes on to show you some other types of sensors and kind of the distribution. You can see that compared to the, uh, the river height and the rainfall sensors, the uh, dam sensors and the water quality, there are many, quite a bit fewer number of those across Japan. Um, the shoreline sensors actually are not so much a sensor per se, but I believe if I remember correctly, it's a building. I mean, they actually go out and sample the water and then they actually run chemical assays on it and then they assess certain, certain uh, things about uh, the water, such as um, you know, turbidity, uh, pH, dissolved oxygen, uh, that type of thing. Um, I think I'm going to select one of those and you can see the, the different types of data that, that uh, there's a lot of data actually that these the green pillars present. Um, the, this is just some showing some of the, the, uh, the inflow and the outflow and the storage level of, of a particular dam that we have selected there. Um, sometimes in the graphs you'll see blank spots and that's just because there is no data. Um, they're just that the sensors there did not provide any data for that period of time. And, oh, I think that's the end of the video. Okay, well, anyways. So, uh, but anyway, so that's kind of the application that we created. Um, so uh, moving on, uh, that, uh, so another type of uh, immersive environment or immersive visualization is using tile display walls. Um, and these tile display walls are multi-screen display walls, uh, which really offer a different type of immersion for visualization and analytics. Um, they're usually quite large shared displays with no resolution constraints. Um, they're also known as scalable resolution shared displays. Um, and you can think of it as kind of a digital lens to big data, and I'm borrowing that phrase from Jason Lee, um, who has worked in this area for many, many years. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's an ultra high resolution display. You can visualize large volumes of data. And importantly, it can be used as a collaborative environment. Uh, and so this is just an example, uh, since we don't have, you know, I can't show you directly uh, what our, but this is our tile display wall here at AIST. Um, and you can see that we've got, you know, different types of data. I have actually, I can stream actually uh, into it the uh, VR application. Um, you can put up PDFs, and this is, of course, the data that I was just showing you in the slide a few slides ago. 
Um, this is a, a, another application that uh, Matt Reddy created, and I'll be uh, talking about that in a, in a minute. Um, but this is just a, to give you an idea of what you know, kind of this uh, you know immersive environment on a tall display wall could look like. So um, you know, we have been working with Jason Lee actually over the last uh, several months, um, and we've been leveraging on his Sage Two scalable amplified group environment middleware for these tile display walls. Um, Sage was created in 2004. Uh, it was rewritten completely in 2014, leveraging on web browser and cloud technologies. Um, as I mentioned, it is uh, middleware, it is open source, and it provides multiple users with a common operating environment, and it allows them to access, display, and share heterogeneous data-intensive information. And it is significantly different, actually, from the current video conferencing type of applications, such as WebEx, GoToMeeting, Skype, uh, Hangout, even Zoom, <laughs> um, because it really allows you to, it allows a level of collaboration that you don't have with these other types of uh, applications. And so it, you, know, you can do this parallel interaction with data that's on the wall. So we've been working, uh, uh, doing a lot of different types of uh, Sage 2 projects uh, for uh, disaster management or smart city type of uh, use cases um, in, within Sage 2. Um, we've been adding and extending new interaction modalities to Sage 2, and, uh, and I'm going to go through, run through a list of, of the different projects uh, next. And it, just to give you some type of context or idea of, you know, kind of where we're going and what, what is possible with these type of large uh, scale displays. One thing I want you to keep in mind is the collaborative aspect of these efforts, you know, and really that's, again, the power of Sage 2 is it allows multiple users to collaborate on the same type of content and really allows them to engage. So, uh, you know, in addition to the VR application, uh, Matt also created a uh, new way of displaying this river sensor data in multiple web pages in Sage 2. So as I showed you, you know, the, we have this traditional web page kind of, you know, multiple web pages and you kind of go through these different pages um, way of looking at the river sensor data. But uh, Matt created a way of displaying all those pages in a one particular application in Sage. And so basically then the user then is able to point to a particular area of interest on the map and, and ask the question, how is this place doing? And when you click on it, then the data from the eight closest sensors populate the surrounding pages. And it really allows us to explore a new way to use these large tile display walls for data. And so that's, this is the a picture of the application that Matt created. And again, in the middle here, you can see this is the traditional website that, that we're leveraging on uh, from the ministry here. But if you click on a particular point here, it's dynamic. And, and what it does is that it finds the eight closest sensors and then it populates them around this particular point. So again, you know, we're asking, okay, how is that place doing? And it just gives you all the data, whatever it may be. As you can see, we've got some camera data here. We have a little bit of river height data, and we also have some some rain uh, rain level or rainfall level data. Now, obviously, some of these sensors may not be that close to the point where you click. Um, that's more just a function of you know where do they have sensors deployed. But you know, I think it it points in you know points to a kind of an interesting way of actually instead of having to drill down and know where you want to go a priori, you know, like what sensor do I want to look at and what area do I want to look at. It's more just look at the map and say, okay, how does this place doing? And just show me the data. Um, another uh, student uh, is working on, uh, and he's from Taiwan. Uh, he's working on a uh, traffic monitoring app with machine learning. And so the goal is to, to, to uh, create a uh, Sage 2 compatible application for this traffic monitoring with machine learning. And we want to stream live webcam video into a Sage application and then the user can set virtual gates and analyze the amount of traffic that's passing by these virtual gates. And uh, the analysis is done by sending these, uh, sending the video back to a server which does all the machine learning uh, analysis on it and then sends the results back into Sage. Um, this is not directly disaster management, it's more urban planning and smart cities, but you can kind of think of it in, as it's in the same vein because you, for disaster management, usually in, in smart cities, you have a lot of sensor networks and you're deploying sensors in smart cities um, and they kind of operate in a normal mode, but if you have a disaster, then everything kind of flips into this disaster or crisis mode and you can use the same type of infrastructure for your disaster management. So this is just a screenshot of kind of his work in progress and what he's doing. So he has a map of Taiwan and he can actually have live video stream into our application in Sage 
And then you can set virtual gates here. This is an example down here on the lower right where you can see the pink and the orange. These are the virtual gates he has set across the uh, roads and you can, you know, it counts basically the number of cars that pass by each one of those uh, virtual gates. Uh, you can see down here that we can actually look at the results video as well and you can see how it's marked each one of the cars and there are actually numbers here on the cars. That's difficult to see, but, it's, uh, but it is there. So uh, another project that we're working on with uh, integrating the leap motion. So uh, as I mentioned, you know, the interaction and way to interact with data, especially in these large scale displays is a little bit of a challenge right now. Um, you know, mouse and keyboard work well, but you know, are there other ways that we can actually uh, enhance or, or create new ways of interacting with data in these in Sage 2? And so I had a student from Thailand who integrated this leap motion, which is a gesture based device um, uh, uh, to control different content on the wall. Um, these are very, it's a very, uh, it, the idea is to provide a more natural mode of user interaction with the content. Um, the large scale walls have used touch screens before, so you can have these large walls with touch screens, but the problem is, is that if they're too big and you're not tall enough, you can't actually tap on the top of the wall and you can't touch and interact with content, and so, and so you're limited by your height, basically. Um, Connect has also been used, um, but it's more of a room scale motion detection, and that can be kind of problematic if you have multiple people in the room. Um, and so the uh, Leap device is more localized, it's more user-centered, so it, it kind of, you can think of it kind of replacing the mouse and keyboard, you know, because you can be sitting there and you can have this little small device sitting in front of you, you can use gestures over it um, and, uh, and control the content. Um, so I have a video, another video, just briefly showing you what, uh, what how it kind of works. Um, he has several different gestures that he has created to actually either uh, left click or right click or to move content or to zoom in or close uh, applications. And so hopefully, I couldn't embed it, so I'm gonna try putting it in, uh, let's see if I can play this one. Okay, so this is, um, so this is uh, the student Thai student, uh, the leap motion device is sitting right here in front of him. And when he, uh, when he does this, he will actually be moving, uh, he will be actually using his hand, you'll see him, and he'll actually be moving content around on the wall, um, hopefully. Yep. So you can see he's actually can move the pointer around just by moving his hand around. Um, he got the interaction to be actually very, very smooth, and it's actually a very natural feeling. Um, we're still working on kind of refining some of the gestures and trying to make it work well in the interface, um, but uh, it, it works pretty well. So we've also integrated some speech recognition to Sage where you can actually talk to it and it actually will do certain things. Um, and so that's partly what we're trying to demonstrate here as well. Um, I believe he's going to try and grab that and then move it. So you can see he made a fist, he grabbed that content and he's moving it over. So that's all I really wanted to show you just to give you a quick idea of what kind of the leap motion was, was doing. So let's see, I'm going to switch back to my slides. So. Um, so in addition to this, uh, one area that we've been working on is kind of linking visualizations. And so uh, we had another student from Jason Lee's lab, uh, Dylan, come. Uh, and the goal is to develop a smart framework, so to speak, for linking applications in stage two. And this will really allow inter-app communication. So it allows one application to communicate with a different application. And so the idea kind of behind it is that we're, it's going to store data and data types on the stage two server and then any app can request or change the data that's there. Um, right now, it requires prior knowledge of what data is available, um, and it works as a publish subscribe system, but we are, are trying to improve that so that you can actually just get to the point where you could just throw data on the wall and actually just have it know what to do with it. So that's the long-term goal of what it does. So uh, he's cre uh, Dylan created a linker application to help streamline this whole process, and it marks uh, you know, source and destination. So it marks an application as a source and another application as a destination of data. Um, and so we are gonna show you a little quick little video here to kind of illustrate that point. So 
and so you know, I had a lot of students this uh, this yeah, summer, and so visualization of medical research. So this was created by a different group of, or, sorry, this was created by two of the student interns here at AIST. And what they are trying to do is visualize uh, medical research in Taiwan to help people figure out where and or what is getting the most attention and where it is being researched. So, uh, by the way, that's Dylan speaking. Can you hear that, by the way? Yeah, we can hear it. Oh, OK. Great. Yep. Thank you. Something I wanted to point out is that the map is interactive. So if I were to hover over a particular region, I get updates with projects. I can click on it. And the other part pieces will update. So if I were to click on diabetes, then it updates with that. So this is now a map of where diabetes research is going on. And in particular, each of these can be clicked on. So you now yank it out. But here is Google Maps. So this is zoom in and zoom out. Let's see, where is this? It is over the United States. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to link between the time map which is able to output its selection of the map and send that coordinate to the Google Maps. So anytime the map is clicked on, then you'll have an updated view of time. The zoom level does remain. So if you wanted a more in-depth view, Let's go to Let's go to a high research area. Which is fairly mountainous. So I think what's interesting about that is that, you know, as, as Dylan said, we were that particular province in Thailand had a lot of medical research projects going on. It had over two hundred. But so you would think it's a very populated area, maybe, but then when you went to the satellite imagery on Google Maps, it's actually pretty rural and a lot of mountains there, and so it was, it was rather interesting. Um, you will click on Bangkok in just a second. Here. It's Bangkok. Oh. Wait, that's not Bangkok. This is Bangkok. <laughs> So you can see, so Bangkok had about 152 different research projects going on, but in, of course, Bangkok is a big city. So, so it was interesting because again, we're trying to link data so you can get different types of data between two different types of applications. And so it enables better uh, ways to look at and analyze uh, data. Okay, so we'll go back to my presentation. All right, so uh, in summary, uh, you know, natural disaster management is really a complex problem that requires interdisciplinary efforts to address many of the research challenges. Um, you know, we are, you know, approaching these problems from a user slash application viewpoint to create accessible and usable visualization tools for disaster management. 
Um, a lot of our future effort will require user testing to inform the further development of these immersive technologies. And again, just kind of bringing it back to at the beginning, you know, again, you know, this bigger picture of creating this multi-site environment where people can collaborate on data um, effectively um, is, uh, you know, kind of where we're headed. So having, you know, that's the main bulk of the presentation, and I think I'm pretty much, I hopefully I'm on time for more, more or less. Um, but one of the things I want to do is I have two shameless plugs here. <laughs> um, so a lot of this activity is happening because of a uh, effort that has started earlier this year it was the Trans-Pacific Visualization Alliance. Um, and so Bill Chang from the NSF has uh, started a lot of this. Um, along with Jason Lee and uh, myself, uh, Fang Pang Lin from uh, NCHC, along with Wei Fong Sai. Uh, you know, and of course, you know, the idea here is that you know, visualization is very important for a lot of modern communication, research, and education. And it's especially valuable for the researchers situated in the Pacific Rim for many different types of applications. And disaster management is one of these particular applications that we're focusing on here. Um, and so this alliance is really designed to advance the collaborative visualization research and education network in the Asia Pacific region through a lot of regional partnerships in Hawaii, Japan, and Taiwan. Um, Australia is welcome to join. In fact, I encourage people from uh, uh, Australia to uh, help with this alliance. Um, we've had a lot of activity throughout the year. We kicked off uh, in February earlier this year with a, the Hawaii workshop, uh, uh, which established this Trans-Pacific Visualization Research and Education uh, Network. Uh, we had some present uh, activities at CENTRA, which was uh, part of the Pragma, earlier Pragma workshop this year in April in Florida. Uh, we have a lot of student internships. I had 11 students over the summer uh, working on various activities related to uh, this uh, visualization effort. Uh, we also had a checkpoint. Uh, it, Taiwan had a, a visualization workshop in July. And of course, the upcoming, as David mentioned, the upcoming meeting in Pragma, we're going to be featuring some of the VR applications uh, at the Pragma booth uh, um, at eResearch. And in December, we're also, the Fong Pan Lin runs his annual SEAIP uh, workshop in Taiwan. And so we'll have further activities and demos there. Um, just you know, if you're interested in joining us, you know, we, you know, disaster management is just one area that we've been working in. Um, uh, you know, so this data, this idea of data integration for decision support scenarios uh, is, is, you know, one broad area that we're working in. Uh, you know, disaster management is one of the use cases, but, and, but this linking visualizations into a knowledge chain is another important aspect of that. And that actually can be, is more generalized. You know, we can use that in other different areas too as well. Um, Sage 2 is also uh, used as a very effective brainstorming or a meeting tool. And so we're trying to figure out new ways of uh, maybe creating a next generation word cloud based on data that's on the wall or uh, visualizing it somehow and creating new ways of you know, generating meeting notes or something like that. Um, and so that's another area of interest that we've identified. Um, many people who were at the initial Hawaii workshop also are uh, interested in the uh, creating an international coral reef science network. So it's of course, you know, coral reef science is very data intensive and can benefit quite a bit from virtual representations of the coral reef. Um, I know that in Australia there is a e-reef uh, project and I, and I hope to uh, speak to some of them when I come in, uh, to, uh, in October to Australia for Pragma. Um, just to give you an idea of, of, of what we did as far as a brainstorming session, this is just a quick picture showing you the, our, the top display wall in Hawaii and how we had populated it with all of our ideas and we were sorting through uh, the different little post-it notes that we put up on the wall, uh, trying to identify and, and go through and figure out how the, the, uh, Pacific, the uh, this Trans-Pacific Alliance was going to move forward. So the, uh, the second plug that I have is for uh, AISD internship opportunities. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I was very fortunate to have uh, Matt Reddy and um, uh, uh, Loshi Pan from uh, Monash come to AIST as part of the MERPA program. And I definitely would have, be, love to host more students uh, for the next round of MERPA. Um, but you know, we, do have, uh, we do have other internship opportunities uh, as well during the summer. 
um, or actually really pretty much year round. I know that the Australian the summer is shifted different, is different from uh, say for example, the US or even Japan. Um, but AIST, we're a public Japanese government funded research institute. Um, our mission basically is to contribute to society through continuous advancement in technologies and support Japanese industries. Uh, we're located in Scuba, Japan. Uh, that's about 45 minutes northeast of Tokyo. Uh, we're a fairly large institute. We have multiple, we have over like five different departments, two different centers, um, about uh, 2,300 researchers and 650 uh, administrative personnel. So we're a you know, sizable organization. Uh, we're also ranked, at least in 2014, that number is a little bit dated, but I don't think it changed much. But we're ranked seventh uh, in the top 20 Japanese research institutions for all fields. So I feel we do pretty good work. Um, so if you're interested in doing uh, an internship here with me or some of my colleagues here, just please come and contact me and uh, we'd be ha I'd ha be happy to discuss that further. Um, so with that, uh, I just want to acknowledge, of course, my colleagues at the Lava Laboratory at University of Hawaii. Jason Lee has been great to work with. Of course, the Merpa program at Monash, uh, Tim has been fantastic as well, um, and it's been a real pleasure working with both of them. Um, as well as the AIST, we have, uh, I'm in charge of a small uh, international team here at AIST, and that's where a lot of our funding comes to help support these internships. Um, and so with that, I will stop here and uh, take any questions you may have. Thank you very much for uh, being here and listening to me today.